Welcome to Securing America with me, Frank Gaffney, the program that's a kind of owner's manual for protecting the country we love against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to the glory of God and his kingdom. A man who I'm very proud to say is both a friend and colleague of many years has devoted his entire professional life, I would argue, to protecting our country against enemies, foreign and domestic. His name is Chuck DeVore. He's a retired lieutenant colonel in the United States Army National Guard, as I recall. He served as a state assemblyman in California. These days, he is the chief for national initiatives at the Texas Public Policy Foundation and a very prodigious contributor to the public policy debates and all kinds of platforms, including, I'm proud to say, this one. And we're delighted to have him always. Welcome back, Chuck. Thanks for having me back, Frank. Always a pleasure. Let me ask you first and foremost, Chuck, you have spent a lot of time thinking about and preparing for and warning the rest of us, for that matter, about the threat that we're facing from the most, well, existential threat to freedom, as our old boss Ronald Reagan used to say, in our history, namely the Chinese Communist Party. You've got a background in intelligence as well as been a consumer of it. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about an important speech made recently by the chief of naval intelligence, a rear admiral by the name of Michael Stedman, in which he suggested that it's astonishing to him that we are failing to connect the dots about the threat we're facing from China. He attributes it to something he calls China blindness. I'd be interested in your take on that and why we are so blind. Well, Frank, it is a, a very important question, and it makes it a little more difficult for, of course, our policymakers to unify uh, the country and to develop an effective response. But, Frank, this is not unusual. You saw this in the years leading up to World War II, where there was a similar blindness about Imperial Japan and Nazi Germany and, and the fascist uh, alignment in Europe. Uh, and, of course, America as a continental nation with the vast reaches of the Pacific and the Atlantic has traditionally been able to afford to kind of ignore uh, threats abroad until it becomes uh, uh, too late and uh, where we have to engage. So I don't really think this is unique. I think that, though, what has added and has made it more difficult is the fact that uh, for a good 30 years, uh, China was acting as if it was some developing third world country, of course, I think it was uh, Dang who famously said, you know, hiding our strength and biding our time. Uh, and they've done that. They've done it very well while attracting hundreds of billions of dollars of hard uh, foreign investment from Europe and from America, as well as stealing uh, hundreds of billions of dollars of intellectual property every year to build up their economy and their and their military. Yeah. And so at least so, now, to put a fine point on being, it, I think it's trillions yes. of dollars uh, yes. in investment and uh, hundreds something like $600 billion annually in right. intellectual property theft. But but to this point, uh, Chuck, and I, I think you've, you've nailed it, um, we're perhaps more willfully blind uh, than otherwise. And I wonder if you would talk a little bit about the extent to which um, this practice the Chinese call elite capture is contributing to that. Well, it certainly does contribute when people are directly uh, remunerated because of their uh, participation with uh, foreign uh, trade with China. Uh, then, of course, it's going to cause uh, elites to believe that uh, it is in our interest because it's in their interest that they're making this money. Uh, a good example uh, is, of course, our alarming and growing dependence on China for key pharmaceuticals. Uh, where you have, for example, uh, all of acetaminophen, for example, is made in China. I think it's 90% of our antibiotics are now made in China. Yeah, uh, it's bad so enough, Frank, that if a, a conflict happened in many key areas, it would take three or four years before the U.S. could ramp up production. And in the meantime, you'd probably have several million Americans that would perish because of that. One of the things that we talked about in a webinar sponsored by our Committee on the Present Danger of China, which I'm proud to have you as a member, is the degree to which our financing has been enabling this. We talked about uh, multiple trillions of dollars uh, in that regard. But Chuck, when you have 
uh, masters of the universe, for want of a better term, on Wall Street, putting the money of American pensioners, including, by the way, uh, perhaps people like yourself invested in the thrift savings plan, the federal government's retirement plan for civilian and military personnel, into Chinese companies, some of which, unbelievably, are actually involved in producing weapons for the People's Liberation Army intended to be used to kill us. This is a degree of, well, not just blindness, I would argue, but complicity, if not treason, really, uh, against our nation. And I wonder to what extent, when the Admiral's pointing this out, uh, in not quite those words, but in terms of the phenomenon, is this a tolerable situation? As a military guy, um, this is, seems to me to be the, the, the most dangerous possible circumstance for us. Well, Frank, even from just a basic investment standpoint, it doesn't make sense because, of course, there is no rule of law in the People's Republic of China. Every investment in that nation exists at the sufferance of the Chinese Communist Party. And even when you buy shares in in Chinese-based companies, you're really not owning shares in a company. You're owning shares typically uh, in an offshore uh, entity uh, that has imaginary shares in China. Uh, and so the challenge is, in a pinch, how do you repatriate any of your earnings? Um, in fact, in fact, in all likelihood, you won't be able to. So you have individuals who have been allured into this supposedly massive market uh, of well over a billion people, by the way, uh, in the middle of a demographic collapse right now. Uh, and the challenge, I think, just from a purely economic standpoint, is you're going to have hundreds of billions of dollars of American assets that are essentially going to be worthless at some point of time in the future. So these fund managers, just out of a fiduciary responsibility alone, not even talking about national security or patriotism, they need to understand that they're putting their clients' money at grave risk. These are not even entities, Frank, that have legitimate accounting or auditing. Uh, so it's a, it's a house of cards. It is, and, and I'm so glad you put this so boldly. What we're talking about, and this was the focus of the webinar, really, is in the event that the balloon goes up, as they say in the military. And I'm not talking about those surveillance balloons. I'm talking about the, the other balloons, the <laughs> war of the old-fashioned kind, shooting kind. Those investments are gone, I think, right. as a practical matter. So there's undisclosed material risk here. And it does seem to me that these, as you say, these uh, guys on Wall Street, the mavens up there, have a fiduciary responsibility both to disclose that risk and take steps now to counteract uh, the dangers. Um, let me ask you, drawing on your experience in Southern California, um, if I may, um, there's been a bit of a controversy in Washington, as you may know, about an individual who is considered by many of us to be a prime example of elite right. capture by the Chinese Communist Party, namely Congresswoman Judy Chu. Um, people are saying, well, any questions about her loyalty to our country is, you know, uh, not uh, not fair. It it it, uh, it it's not uh, it's not um, well. It's beyond the pale. I guess is the way Mike Gallagher put it. What are your thoughts? Do do you have a right. sense of, um, in fact, her degree of mm -hmm. compromise, as they say, by the CCP? So I served with Judy Chu in the State Assembly. Uh, so I, I know her uh, personally. I work with her. Uh, the challenge, Frank, that you have throughout America is that virtually all of our uh, Chinese-based um, uh, you know, ethnic groups, if you will, have been penetrated by United Front organizations. And so you have a lot of money and a lot of organizational uh, expertise coming from I have to, have from to hold that thought. We're going to come right back to it with more with Chuck DeVore, United States Army retired, right after this.